This is for a boy between 9 and 11. I'm in a place called Katakush, just outside of Mosul. This is a, a church that was completely destroyed uh, by ISIS. As we were coming through, one of our team uh, discovered one of the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. I don't know who gave it, who sent it, but uh, it touched the life of a child at one point. And of course, we ask people when they pack a box to always pray. You never know where that box will go. Where are the lost? Where are the hardest to get to people groups? Where has the gospel of Jesus not been preached and proclaimed? In Acts 13, 47, for so the Lord has commanded us saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. We live in a broken world, an evil world. Yet Jesus gave us orders. He said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a job to do. When we talk about going to the ends of the earth, we're talking about shoebox gifts that are taking the gospel to the hardest to reach areas of the world. If you want to bring hope to a broken society, it's the gospel. An Operation Christmas Child is not about passing out toys, it's about the gospel. Each kid, when they receive that box, they're gonna hear the presentation of the gospel clearly. They make a decision for Christ, and then they're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others. And many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. We're in the South Pacific. I want to reach these islands for Christ. These are the poor areas. People don't have any hope. People don't come here. There's no tourists here, but we're going to be here. I'm right outside of Mazlan, Mexico, about six hour drive up in the mountains with Operation Christmas Child. This is where people that are brave are taking Operation Christmas Child to the ends of the earth. We need boxes that are packed by families, by churches and groups, but we also need boxes that are packed online. When you build a shoe box online, these are the boxes that give us access into hard to reach places of the world. We go at great lengths, great effort, to take these boxes to children in the most remote parts of the world. It's an incredible journey. You know, the mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus. Children are coming to faith. Children are being discipled and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. For those of you that don't think what we're about to do is appropriate, I just want to let you know it is 1014. Uh, our service has not begun. This is not a part of the morning worship service. But can we not take just a minute and celebrate? Uh, and so stand to your feet. Stand up if you would.
seated if you would. Uh, now we're going to, I have to say this, we're going to move to that which is of e eternal importance, right? Okay, so we're going to transition and uh, I'm going to go uh, put on a different shirt. I just cannot preach in a t-shirt. It's just not in me. Okay, but I'll turn it over to Alan. All right.
Uh, let me get you in and invite you to stand with us as we continue our worship this morning, doing an old hymn, a new way. What are you doing up here, brother? <laughs> well, all right, you got a different lineup than I got, and you're the new senior pastor, so I'll step right over here. Can you hear me now? I thought there was a standing ovation for me when I first came in, but no. Uh, Linda Morgan is doing really well, um, and that's a praise. She has been through a lot and still has uh, more to go, but she's doing very well. And uh, so we want to remember her. Also, um, those that we need to pray for quite a good list here. Uh, Dwayne Easter is back home. He has been in Houston, I believe, and he is back home to undergo, I believe, three months of chemo, and he will have to go back to Texas, but uh, let's remember Dwayne uh, in our prayers. Uh, Janie Housley is having a procedure Tuesday morning uh, and we pray that you would uh, uh, lift her up also. Um, Pat Anderson has a nephew that has got a long road of recovery, and she had another nephew passed away uh, two or three days ago. So we need to remember Pat. That nephew was living with her. Um, Allison Williamson, Allison uh, is here. There's a shower for her afterward. She did spend a couple of days in the hospital this past week, and she is doing well now, and they're putting off the uh, inducement for as long as they can for, for the baby's sake and hers. Um, 
Jim Miller has an uncle that has cancer in Florida and uh, it's progressing and not, not doing very well when he has an aunt that had just been diagnosed with cancer also, breast cancer. We pray that you'd be with her. Um, those are all that I know of at the present time. So let's, let's pray for these. Father, we do want to acknowledge your power and your mercy when you act and we see the praises of what you have done. And we just thank you for those. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come and bow in your holy and reverent and awesome name. I just pray that you would uh, be with us, that you would listen to our petitions, and we know that, we, that you do. Anytime we pray in your will, we know that you hear, and we thank you for that. We thank you for your presence with us. Lord, I want to lift up each of those names again that are hurting and have needs, I just pray that you would uh, meet those needs as only you can. The, I know that there are others in this uh, auditorium that have needs that maybe we're not even aware of, but you are. We just pray that you would meet each need according to your will. I thank you for a pastor that stands and unashamedly preaches your word. Lord, we... Lift up our country to you. Um, the Christian family, as you ordained it, is under awesome attack. We just pray that you would uh, protect our families. Also, the churches are under so much attack. We just pray that you would be with our churches. Lord, there are many that are not standing as they should, and we just pray that they would, would gather back up under your name. I pray that you would uh, use our pastor, that you would fill him, bless him as he comes, and breaks the bread of life to us. And Lord, I pray that if there's one person in here that is not assured of their salvation, the day might be the day that they would make it right with you. I pray that our, with our praise team as they continue to lead us in worship to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Then I repented of my 
going just bring it down a little bit where did the bunch go that was in here for rocky top did they sneak out and replace them with exact replicas of you guys <laughs> i saw every one of you guys clapping during rocky top all right let's get it going for the lord all right i heard about his healing all this cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me. Beyond the crystal sea, and I heard the angels singing of the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing a fair song of victory. Well, I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the Angels singing and the old redemption story. At some sweet day, I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. ago one of our uh, young men Ryan 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 are you here this morning Ryan's way up there in the corner he come to me he said hey I got a song I want you to sing and when the youth comes and brings you a song you don't know what you're gonna get <laughs> but we maybe have done this song here one time before and I thought man it was so well timed and so thank you uh, Ryan for bringing this uh, back to us you're the God who stays what a good song If I were you, I would have given up on me by now. I would have labeled me a lost cause, cause I feel just like a lost cause. If I were you, I would have turned around and walked away. Be on repair. Cause I feel like I'm beyond repair Oh, but somehow you don't see me like I do Somehow you're still here You're the God who stays You're the God who stays 
You're the one who runs in my direction When the whole world walks away You're the God who stands With wide open arms And you tell me nothing I have ever done Can separate my heart from the God who stands I used to hide Every time I thought I let you down I always thought I had to earn my way But I'm learning you don't work that way Oh, but somehow you don't see me like I do Somehow you're still here You're the God who stays You're the God who stays you're the one who runs in my direction when the whole world walks away you're the God who stands with wide open arms and you tell me nothing I have ever done to separate my heart from the God who stays oh I like this your shame can't separate my guilt, can't separate my past, can't separate. I'm yours forever. My sin can't separate my scars, can't separate my failures, can't separate. I'm yours forever. No separate no power of hell can take away your love for me will never change i'm yours forever you're the god who stays you're the god who stays you're the one who runs in my direction when the whole world walks away the God who stands with wide open arms, and you tell me nothing I have ever done can separate my heart from the God who stays. Yeah, yeah, you're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction when the whole world walks away. You're the God who stands with wide open arms And you tell me nothing I have ever done Can separate my heart from the God who stays Let's bless his name. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Let's continue with one more. I'm trading my sorrows. We say, yes, Lord, yes. Let's sing it, guys. All right, here we go. I'm trading my sorrows. For the joy of the Lord I am trading my sickness And I am trading my pain And I am laying them down For the joy of the Lord Oh, we say yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord Oh, I am praying. 
Christ will endure, that His joy is going to be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, His joy comes in the morning. I am trading my sorrows. I am trading my shame. And I am laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm my sickness. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my the Lord. Oh, let's say yes. Say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Executed, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for His promise will endure. But His joy is going to be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, His joy comes. Let me go ahead and dismiss kids to kids club this morning with Adam and Kara. If you're a guest today, ages 4 through 5th grade, you can head over next door and have a great uh, time with them uh, on their level. And let me just go ahead and comment about uh, kind of celebrating there at the beginning that uh, I know Drew is going to want to do that with Michigan. And Jason is probably going to want to do that regarding Florida. My mother-in-law already asked me this morning if we could do that regarding Ohio State. And the answer to all that is no, okay? Because we hate all your teams, that's right. That's, that's why we're not doing it, right? Okay. You know, there are certain things that just fly all over me. There are times when... I can become just a little bit unglued, depending on something that somebody's doing. And uh, this incident is a little bit telling about me. I haven't changed a whole lot, unfortunately, through the years. But I remember I was in fourth grade. We were playing kickball on the playground at recess. And you know how certain memories, I guess, cause the adrenaline it just kind of seals in your memory. And that's been over 50 years ago. But playing kickball, and all of a sudden everybody was looking at something else, and I finally followed the gaze and looked, and there was a, a fifth grade boy had jumped on a girl's back and was hitting her in the head, and she had her arms up trying to protect herself. Well, that boy, his last name was Reinhardt, I remember that, and the girl was one of my sisters, Amy, who's a year older than me. And my dad taught us... Uh, you never hit anybody from behind, and you don't hit a girl. And um, 
He also taught us that we might squabble as brothers and sisters, but we're also to take up for each other. And so I went flying across that playground and knocked him off of her. And just in a rage, I got on top of him. I didn't hit him because I didn't want to hurt him. I wanted to choke the life out of him. <laughs> and my hands locked on his throat, and I was choking him. And I can remember a girl behind me, because kids, you know, gathering around, and a girl said, oh my goodness, he's going to kill him. And I remember kind of hearing that and thinking, she's right, I'm going to kill him. And I remember thinking, he's turning a shade of blue right now, even as I contemplate this. And, and I remember thinking, uh, well, I didn't really think, I guess, that having a murder record on your or, uh, murder on your record as a fourth grader is usually not a good thing. And so I, I finally let loose of him. And he gasped for air, and he lived to see another day, hopefully to never hit another girl. There's a scene in the movie uh, Clear and Present Danger. Harrison Ford plays the role of Jack Ryan, who works for the CIA, and he's in London, I think, uh, speaking, but he's also just kind of touristing with his family. And there's this IRA um, uh, attack upon part of the royal family. And he just happens to be there on the street when this happens. And I think he was a former Marine, and, and he gets into the fray, and he ends up getting one of the guns from one of the IRA guys and ends up shooting a couple of them, and that starts the whole plot of the movie. I think he also himself gets shot in the shoulder. So he's back in the States, and he's talking to a friend of his, and this friend asked him, he said, Why? Why, why did you do it? Why did you jump into the fight? And I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like, just rage. Pure rage. He said, it, it ticked me off. It made me mad that they would go after innocent people. So let me ask you this morning, what does it take to tick you off? What does it take to to fire you up, to, to stir up your spirit? What does it take for you to, to get up off your bottom and to get on your feet? What does it take for you to, to get hot? What does it take for you to pound the, the table about something? What does it take if you're Ralphie in the Christmas story? Right? Remember that? How many times does the bully have to harass you? How many snowballs do you have to get hit in the face with on a cold winter day before you finally go postal on him? What does it take in your life as a follower of Jesus Christ to say, that is enough. We're not doing any more of this. I'm taking a stand on this right here, right now. What is important enough for you to pay a price and to take a stand? Now, I assume we all struggle with getting angry and taking action against the right things, right? Sometimes we get upset about the wrong things. Sometimes we don't get upset about the things we ought to. I'm sure that all of us at times have gotten upset about something and have maybe expressed that. And then we do a little review and we look back and we have to acknowledge that our righteous indignation was really not all that righteous. Maybe a little bit more selfish. And I'm sure that there are times for all of us that we look back and realize that we just sat with the crowd. We sat in fear, afraid of stepping out fearful of being courageous and taking a stand that God would have us to take because we didn't want to seem like someone who was an extremist. We didn't want to seem like someone that was given to overreaction. We didn't want to seem like somebody that became a little over the top or a little nutty when it came to doing what's right. You know, it's interesting as you think about a lot of our favorite movies, a lot of our favorite movies are about individuals, some of them historical characters, that were a little bit over the top when it came to taking a stand and, and doing what was right. I, I think of Mel Gibson's portrayal of, of William Wallace in Braveheart. I think of Elliot Ness and his 
fight against crime played by Costner in The Untouchables. I think about Maximus and Gladiator, and I even think of Tony Stark and, and uh, Iron Man. These are good guys, but guys that we see as a little over the top as they take on the bad guys. And so there's something within every one of us that celebrates when the underdog rises up and with great courage does what every one of us wants to think we would do if we found ourselves in those circumstances. That is why I believe the story of David and Goliath is so powerful. And it's not just a story. It's a true story of unbelievable courage and conviction leading a man to step up and stake, take a stand when nobody else would. It's the story of an underdog. It's the story of an arrogant, foul-mouthed bully. It's a story about conviction and, and taking a stand for God. It's a, a story about faith. It's a story about shutting up an enemy of God. And it is a story about being what each of us knows we ought to be. If you've not done so yet, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. David has been traveling back and forth. You remember he's the youngest son of, I believe it was eight. And he's going from home to the battle site of the Israelites against the Philistines. That's about a, a 14 mile trip each way. So at times he's home. And at times he is going um, through the instruction of his dad to the battle site, uh, generally to take supplies to his brothers and maybe some of their commanders. This battle is taking place in a, a place called the, the Valley of Elah. And what you have is each um, army uh, typically would be on... Uh, each side of the valley as the hill would go up. And this is the Elah Valley today. And so generally what you would have is uh, you would not want to give up the high ground. You're always at a disadvantage when you're below your enemy. And so they would go up and then uh, neither was going to concede that. So generally uh, they're going to fight in the middle, in the valley. Now, we have a pretty good idea of the location of this battle today because, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes, but you remember there was a, a brook. You remember David gets some stones. And, and so there's only one brook really in this valley. And so we have a pretty good idea of where this took place. Goliath was <clears throat> something around nine feet, six inches tall. Ancient history tells of three men that we know of that were uh, reportedly over 10 feet tall. One, I remember, was from Persia. Now, in modern history, the tallest man that we know of was a man by the name of Robert Pershing Wadlow. He stood at just a, a tad under 9 feet tall. He died at an early age, died when he was only 22 years old, and he died in 1940. Now, Goliath <clears throat> wore a, a coat of mail, as they call it, that weighed about 125 pounds. If you'll look at a couple of verses, verses 6 and 7, he had a javelin slung over his back. <clears throat> his spearhead weighed about 15 pounds. If you glance down at verse 33, he had been a man of war from his youth, so he had years of experience to develop skill and strategy. And we read that for 40 days, he disrespected and he defied not only the people and the army of God, but God himself. He spoke of God, our God the omnipotent God, the God of the universe. He spoke of God as though He were just some man-made, impotent, good-for-nothing, that existed only in the minds of this, these scared, still soldiers. 
He was a big, large, arrogant bully with absolutely no fear of the living God. Look with me in 1 Samuel 17, 10. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now there's an interesting little tidbit, I think, in verse 23, if you'll go down to there. And in verse 23 of this chapter, we read that the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, was coming up from the armies of the Philistines. Did you catch that? That he's coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And if I read this correctly, what I think is happening is that you have the, the sides of the valley going up. You two have the two armies that are camping on the hillsides where uh, the, the battle usually would be taking place in the valley. But Goliath has not come down just to the bottom of their hillside. And Goliath has not just stopped in the middle of the valley. And Goliath has not just gotten to the far side of the valley. Look at what it says. He was coming up from the armies of the Philistines. He's coming uphill. He didn't care about having the high ground. He's coming into the camp of the Israeli army. And the point and the lesson, I think, with that, folks, is that that's what your giants will always do. They never stay in the valley. If you don't deal with them, if you don't take them on, they will always encroach further and further and further into your lives. There has to be a point before they're sleeping in your tent that you have to say, enough is enough. You're not coming any further. Now, all of this, this squaring up, these 40 days, this big mouth, foul mouth giant, his encroaching into the territory of Israel, all of that simply ticked David off. It just ticked him off. It was just wrong. And he wasn't going to have any more of it. And he does something about it. Even though he was probably just in his 20s, if not still a teenager. Now, it's not that hard to take a stand for what's right when we're in the majority, right? It's not that hard to take a stand for what's right when we're bigger than our opponent. But when we are plain and simply outmatched, then it becomes another story, right? And I don't know what that looks like or feels like for you. Maybe that looks like or feels like that right there, you know? But the little guy seems to still be on the offensive, right? Okay. I don't know what that looks like or feels like. Maybe it, it feels like that, right, if you're under trucking. And you're in the little Mini Cooper. I used to have a little red Mini Cooper. Used to get passed up by trucks like that. Maybe it looks or feels like that, okay? And I probably shouldn't have used that one. That's probably not politically correct, but uh, that's what we feel like sometimes, right? Maybe it looks or feels like this, right? And then my favorite, maybe it looks or feels like this, Right? I love the little grin on his face. He's kind of like grinning, I think maybe like David did, like uh, he has no idea what he's in for, you know? He's about to get it. When it feels or looks like this, the question is this. Is there still enough desire within us for right to prevail that it leads us to stand and say, bring it on? Well, there was with David. In fact, there, there had been before. But before we talk about the lion and the bear, let, let's talk just a little bit more about the details of this story. When David comes on the scene, it's after nearly six very embarrassing weeks of God's people being mocked 
by the Philistine giant. If you kind of skim over verses 20 through 24, what we find is that the two armies squared off against each other every day, twice a day, and each time what was happening is that the army of Israel was cowering at the side of Goliath. A couple of uh, cultural features here is that documents have been discovered that show us that it was a fairly common thing in the ancient Near East for armies to do this, for uh, each to pick a champion. And I guess it saved a lot of lives. It was kind of a winner take all, your best man against my best man. Another point of interest is that when we look at this, when we understand that in ancient times and how that played out, that we obviously understand that the most likely candidate on the Israelite side to take on Goliath was who? Well, King Saul. Why? Well, number one, he's king. In number two, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2, it refers to Saul, a choice and handsome man, from his shoulders and up he was taller than any of the people. But Saul was no fool, nor was he a man of faith, nor was he a man of conviction. So David comes along, and he asks, who does this jerk of a giant think that he is anyway? David says, I'll take him on because somebody needs to shut him up. Now I want you to notice with me, look with me in verses 25-26. I want you to notice there's a different mindset that David has in contrast to everybody else, to the whole army of Israel. David sees things and thinks about things very differently. And I want you to notice with me that the men of Israel, they saw Goliath defying Israel. Verse 25. David saw Goliath defying the armies of the living God. The men of Israel focused on Goliath's appearance. They ask, have you seen this man who has come up? David didn't focus on his appearance. He focused on his pride and how he mocked God. He asked, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The men of Israel were a little bit uh, preoccupied with what could happen for the guy that could possibly take down the giant. And, and so they talk about the rewards that Saul was offering, great wealth. You get to marry the king's daughter, and you're not going to have any taxes. David is not preoccupied with that. David is concerned about, quote, taking away the reproach of Israel, the covenant people of God. The bottom line is that Saul and his army did what we often do. They just kind of left God out of the whole picture. Their safety was more important than God being mocked. The answer was their military ability instead of an almighty God taking just one person who was willing to be used to bring about a great victory. Now this contrast that we see between David and the soldiers is brought even into clearer focus when we think about the contrast between David and his oldest brother. Look with me, if you would, in verse 28. Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he, David, spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And so David is ticked off because God is being mocked. Eliab is ticked off because his little brother is nosing around and asking questions. Again, we can get sidetracked so easily from what really matters. His focus shouldn't have been on David, it should have been on Goliath. And so Eliab openly tries to belittle David. And he tries to make him look like a little snot-nosed kid that shouldn't even be there. And folks, there's another lesson here. And the lesson here is that sometimes... It is our family. Sometimes it is our church family. 
Sometimes it is our brothers and sisters in Christ who are the quickest to discourage us from slaying the giants in our lives. But like David here, we cannot let them hinder us from entering the battle, especially when they are not even engaged in the battle themselves. Look, look at verse 28. Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? He's very, being very condescending, obviously. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you come down to see the battle. You know, David very easily could have said, battle? What battle? I don't see any battle. I don't see any bloodshed. All I see is a giant with a big mouth. And so the sad but true fact is that many of us, if we're not careful, will be dominated by giants in our lives because of the discouragement of other believers. I remember years ago I was in college and I spent several summers in Manitoba, Canada. And I did some work with Native Americans, with the Indians. And what I learned is that the Indians, the, the social problems on the reservations are profound. But what I learned is that it was similar to African Americans getting out of the ghetto that there were many that did not want them to get out. Many did not want them to get off of the reservation, and they had a derogatory word. Someone who was trying to get an education, someone who was trying to get a better job, someone who was trying to move forward in life with their family and, and do better by themselves, they would often be referred to as an apple. They would say, you're red on the outside, white on the inside. It was a negative term to try to help keep people where they were. And so misery loves company. And those who are not living victoriously, obviously, or, or oftentimes, do not like to see others do so. And so how we face our giants, folks, all really, most of the time, it is going to be in contrast with everybody around us. Because most people, like the Israeli army, most people are going to see impossible situations and they are going to resign themselves to those situations. And they are going to become uncomfortable when we begin to talk about what is right and about taking a stand and about stepping up and by the grace of God doing something about the situation. And so David is terribly outmatched, and he has nobody in his corner except King Saul, who is glad to have somebody step forward so that he doesn't have to. Now, King Saul doesn't start that way. At first, he does try to discourage David from taking on Goliath. Look with me, if you would, in verse 33. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the, this Philistine to fight with him, for you're, you're a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his servant's sheep. Now, I want you to notice that. You notice the past tense? Now, he just left his father's sheep. But I think David right here is seeing that a new day is dawning. He is on the scene, and, and nobody has done what he's about to do. I think he sees that the, the shepherding maybe is going to be part of his past because he's about to become a warrior because his faith is in God Almighty. So he says, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth, and when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he's defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. This is a picture. A good friend of mine, old college roommate, the guy on the right, 
uh, go hunting with him every year, and he went to Kodiak Island a couple of years ago off the coast of Alaska and shot a grizzly. What you don't see is the rifle. It's probably about a 50 caliber he needed to take that thing down. You don't see that. I'll tell you what he didn't do. He didn't grab it by the beard and strike it and kill it. But that's what David did. Now, I think it's important to see, as he talks about the lion and the bear, I think it's important to try to understand a little bit of what David is communicating and how David seemed to take uh, responsibility for the job that he had been given. And I think it's very different than the way most of us think about our jobs. I think David, from all indications, seemed to have this mindset that, okay, I'm the youngest of eight. I get that. You remember when Samuel came to anoint one of the sons as king? David, all of them are there except David. And I think David saw, you know, God chose to put me last in line. And the kid that is last in line is the one that has to be out with the sheep. But this is my God-given role. This is my God-given responsibility. And where most of us would say when a lion or a bear comes along, we would just have to say, sorry, Dad, sorry, family. Uh, we're going to have to lose a few sheep. David didn't see it that way. David saw it as wrong for them to take the sheep. David seemed to have the mindset to the lion, you want something to eat, you go chase down a gazelle. Right? He seemed to think of the bear. You want something to eat? You go find some honey. But it's wrong for you to take these sheep. These are my sheep. They belong to my family. They've been put in my care. And I am going to trust the one that put me in this role and this responsibility to give me victory over you because what you're trying to do is just simply wrong and I'm not putting up with it. And with that frame of mind, when he sees Goliath come along, Goliath's just another enemy. He's just another beast, if you will, to trust God to give victory over. Look at verse 36. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. As I mentioned earlier, if we were to go there today, and I've had the privilege to, to be there, and we can go to this valley, and we could go because of this brook, we could go to a spot uh, we believe pretty close to the site uh, where this battle took place. When I was there a number of years ago, it was a cornfield. And as we were at this little brook, I, I didn't know at the time, um, I didn't quite understand how that worked. I, I picked up a little souvenir shop, a sling. Uh, I think it was probably a good bit bigger than this. And they would tie one around a wrist, and then you would hold this, and you'd sling it around, and you let go. And, and they became very good at the, with these and, and very accurate with these. And, and in that little brook in the Valley of Elah, I picked up five stones. And so you put one of those in the sling, and you twirl it, and, and you let it rip. I did not know then when I picked these up I found out later that the rocks that they threw in these slings was about the size of your fist, about the size of a baseball. Now, a couple days ago, before they got knocked out of the playoffs, the Braves were playing, and Ronald Lacuna was at bat, and fastball coming about 95 miles an hour and caught him right here on the elbow. And it took a few minutes for him to feel like getting back in the game, understandably. Imagine a 9,500, because they could throw these things 9,500 miles an hour. Imagine a 9,500 mile an hour rock popping you right here in the forehead. Well, that's what happened. Now, as David steps up to the giant, I am not absolutely certain what he was thinking. I've wondered if he was thinking something similar to what Daniel's friends thought before they got thrown into the fire furnace. You remember that? Was he thinking, I don't know what's going to happen. 
I don't know if God's going to deliver me. I know God can. But just as those three said, no matter what happens, we're not bowing the knee to this pagan idol. In a similar way, David said, no matter what happens, I'm not walking away from this big mouth. Or, and I think to me what seems a little more likely, is that the thought of losing and the thought of dying, it appears to have never really even entered the mind of David. He is stepping forth with unbelievable faith. But it is a faith built upon his previous experiences, his previous trust, his confidence that God was going to take care of him and help him to overcome his enemies when he stood for what was right. And so David didn't know for sure, though, exactly how this was going to pan out. He didn't have his Bible. He, he hadn't been told this story from the time he was a kid about the story of David and Goliath and standing up against the giants in your life. Notice the tone of confidence in David's voice. Look in verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, I love this. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Amen? That all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. And then notice in verse 48 that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistines. He's not tiptoeing up with great faith and great confidence. He's running into the fray, confident that God is going to give a victory. But why? Why would he do this? Why would he put himself in harm's way? Why would he fight a battle no one expected him to fight, much less win? Why would he put his life on the line against such stacked odds? It's rendered differently in different versions. I like the King James Version in this verse. David is going back and forth with his oldest brother, Eliab. When we read in verse 29, David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Is this not worth fighting for? Is this not important enough? Is this not worth taking a stand over? And folks, those questions... They come to us on a pretty regular basis. A student tells another student to move their arm so that they can copy off of their page. Honesty. Is that worth saying no for? A teen encourages another teen to stop liking one of the kids that's not so popular. Kindness. Is that worth becoming unpopular yourself for? An employer tells an employee to falsify a report to make them look better. A clear conscience. Is that worth fighting for? An athlete falls behind other athletes because the other athletes are using illegal performance-enhancing drugs. Integrity, is that worth sitting on the bench for? An opportunity presents itself for you to cheat on your income taxes and nobody will ever know. Our walk with God, is that worth doing the right thing for? A dirty joke is told in the break room at work. 
Our testimony, is that worth the awkwardness of not laughing? Now some of those may seem like giants to you and some may not. The question I have is this, when is something important enough? When is something meaningful enough that you say, this is something I've got to deal with? This is something I'm, I'm not going to just sit on my hands about anymore. What's important enough for us to take a stand and do something? Are we followers of Jesus? Are we people who will take a stand? Are we people of courage even when we're outmanned, even when we're outmatched, even when we look foolish to those who have little or no faith? Theodore Elp rightly asked, Was not God being defamed? Was not the God of Israel being shamed before the two armies? Was not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being belittled before the unbelieving Philistines and before his own people? David was asking his brother if he could conscientiously tolerate God's name being dragged in the mud and not do something about it, is there not a cause? David believed rightly that there was. Well, folks, this morning, as we look to close, we talked about a very real battle between two men, David and Goliath, and I tried to draw some parallels to the believer today in the battles that we face. You know, we can think about this as a church family. As a church family, you know, Israel had territory that God had given them. And the Philistines were on their territory. Are we going to trust God to empower us to take the territory with its giants that He's given us. You know, I don't know what giants stand in our way. I know for many churches, the economy is beginning to feel like a giant. A pastor friend of mine told me recently, he said, I just told everybody to, to take their budget lines and cut it in half. Now, we're doing fine. But for the first time in a decade, we're not meeting budget. It's a reality, right? There are other giants. We're kind of off the beaten track. I get that. And I'll tell you this. We're a church, a church family that has decided that we're going to not just believe, but we're going to practice to the best of our ability everything in the Word of God. That will bring some opposition, will it not? And so, as a church family, we have to lock arms and we have to keep moving forward and be what God has called us to be by faith and with courage. Amen? Amen? Amen. And let me close this on a personal level. Let me ask you to do this. Let me, close your eyes with me, if you would. Close your eyes. I want to encourage you to envision your worst giant your worst giant that may be in the classroom it may be on the ball field it may be at work it may be in the break room it may be in your home it may be at a family gathering this Thanksgiving or this Christmas it may be in your neighborhood it may be with a group of your friends I want you to envision the toughest place for you personally to take a stand for Jesus Christ. You're not at church right now, but you're in that situation. And you're going to be back in reality in that situation soon enough. I want you to decide now, not then. I want you to decide right now what you're going to do. I don't know what you're going to say. I don't know how you're going to respond. God will show you that. He'll give you the grace for that. I want you to decide 
the next time you face your worst giant, are you going to stand for him? And with eyes closed, not looking around, if you're going to stand then, I want to invite you to stand right now. Would you stand to your feet? Would you face the giant? Would you say, I'm going to trust God and I am going to stand and I'm going to step forward and I'm going to be what God's called me to be for His honor and for His glory. Would the rest of you stand with me if you would? Father, we want to commit this time. Alan, you guys come on up if you would. And Father, we want to pray and ask in these next few minutes that it would be a time of just sealing these decisions. Father, that you would enable us just to continue to, to, to ponder and to see ourselves in those situations that we dread the worst. Father, to know that you will come through for us just as assuredly as you did for David. And you will honor our faith and you will honor our commitment to the cause of Jesus Christ. Father, help us to, to stand by faith and to be people of conviction. And Father, people that are courageous to do what you've called us to do. We're going to sing a, a song, and, and this is going to be our song, a different type of song of invitation. It speaks about taking a stand. And so I pray that this time would be a help to all of us to continue just to anchor in our hearts and our minds that we're going to be people. They're going to follow the faith of David. And then we're going to be what God's called us to be. This altar will be open. Maybe it's going to be a help to you to, to come to the altar for a minute. Maybe you want to leave at the altar some fear. Maybe you want to leave at the altar some anxiety. Maybe you want to take a minute to do that. You want someone to pray with you, I'd be honored to. But whether it's at the altar where you stand, let's sing this song. Alan's going to lead us in it. And let's move forward is the army that God would have us to be. Father, we commit these next min few minutes to you. Again, I pray that you would anchor in our hearts these commitments, that you would help us to be what you would have us to be. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Alan, lead us if you would. You stood before creation Eternity in your hand You spoke the world into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failures and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart. Offer this heart, oh 
Classics Luncheon, and I wanted to kind of clarify a couple of things about uh, the ministry itself. Uh, you're going to find that our gatherings are going to be more than just entertaining. Uh, we are wanting to inform you of things, and we're going to have been, uh, community guests that are going to make our uh, seniors community uh, more aware of maybe things that they're entitled to in our community. And uh, so we're going to have some of the specialists in our community that will be our guests. We're going to have our own classics band and you'll enjoy some of the music and those type things but I, I want to assure you one thing we cannot do this without you okay I need workers and this little sheet of paper here not only asks for you to volunteer food but it also says would you uh, consider serving would you consider cooking would you consider any of those type things as needed and so I'd love to hear from you and and find out some of your ideas. The first uh, luncheon is November 10th. We'll be doing a little bit of, uh, of uh, uh, casting ideas uh, uh, to uh, really look forward to the new year with this. But uh, if you uh, w would like to ask any questions, I'll be down here. There, there's going to be, for the next few weeks, there'll be some sign-ups down here on the front pew and over here on the table, as well as all the welcome areas. And we'd love to have you. And Brother Bill has assured me that if you are not a part of this, then I'm fired. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Miss Janet. Morning, church. Just want to uh, come as a representative from the personnel team just to remind you that we are in the season of appreciation for our pastors and our staff. And I just want to let you know that we'll be coming together Sunday, October 30th with a potluck dinner, a potluck lunch to celebrate this time with our staff. And up until then, we're taking a love offering so that on that day, we'll be able to present our gifts of love to our pastors and staff at that time. 
you know, we're supposed to do our work, anything you do, whatever you do, we are to do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. And I am so thankful that our pastors and our staff do that very thing because God is not only glorified with that, we are blessed because of that. So this is the season we have to be able to give them that, that blessing from us. So just want to remind you of that. There's a love offering. Uh, you can use the um, offering envelopes that are in the pews to put your gift to staff appreciation. Or if you use the Tidely app on your phone, there's a designation there for that as well. And we'll be presenting those gifts on Sunday, October 30th. Bring your covered dish, enough for your family and a couple more people, and we'll have a good time. Thank you. I, uh, I've been assured that Pastor Bill has said that cupcakes are his favorite for the potluck, so you can fulfill that order already for that. Uh, I'll take brownies, just saying. Uh, so with that, though, as well, we have several other opportunities to be able to declare the gospel out into this community. One of those that's coming up is coming right around the corner. It's right here with Halloween coming around the corner. We have our trunk or treat that is going to be happening here on this campus from 6 to 7.30 on Halloween night. So with that being said, we need you to help support the local dentist ministries by bringing candy, okay? So that way we can hand those out to the children that are coming, to the families that who will be on our campus for no other reason than to be able to share the love of Jesus Christ that we have had a king who has been so generous to us that we would be able to be just as generous to them to present the gospel to them. Amen? So please come bring your bags of candy. We have tubs that are out in the Welcome Center for you to be able to drop that in. But also, man, come ready with your car decorated. Come ready to serve just to be able to show some love on some people here in the ministry. Uh, I know my family, we're already ready. I'm not going to tell you what we're going to do uh, because I think mine's better than yours. So prove me wrong. Uh, and then one of the other things that I want to bring up is tonight here we have a upstream night that is going to be going on. It's going to start at 6 o'clock. I'm going to be teaching and going over why am I for the sanctity of human life? Why am I for the sanctity of human life? So be here back tonight at 6 o'clock as we go through that. Uh, and before we leave, I want to share just a couple of words of encouragement as well. Uh, as we had... Uh, our, our missions weeks, uh, so just a little while ago, uh, we were so blessed to receive some thank you cards from some of our missionaries. And so I wanted to read just some lines from, from a couple of them. Uh, one reads, thank you for blessing our ministry through your in-gathering offering. Your generosity added thousands to our ministry's account. So that way they can go into the darkness of the world spreading the light of the gospel. Another one, it said, it made us it made us to remember that we are all in this together. We want to thank you for many years of giving. You have been faithful. Thank you, too, for the generous gifts from the in-gathering offering. Man, what an opportunity. Not only through serving physically, but also through financials that we are able to go and spread the gospel into this lost and dying world that they so need. May we stand up and spread that. So as we get ready to leave, as we get ready to continue to worship, as we go out into this world, remember, remember that it is the gospel that is worthy of a cause. The gospel is worthy of a cause. And as you leave, we also have uh, offering plates that are out back and, and around the building. So please feel free uh, to minister in that way. Brother, go ahead. L lastly, uh, let me go ahead and get you to stand as we get ready to be dismissed. Hey, choir, did you enjoy the choir this morning? It's good to see them back today and sharing with us. And it is that we're heading into that season, right? So uh, we're getting ready for Christmas. Uh, there will be a short meeting uh, after the service, right back here in the choir room, 10 minutes and you're out. If you are in the choir, I expect to see you there. Uh, there we're going to get books and CDs and all that good stuff for the Christmas uh, music. 
And if you are interested in being in the choir and joining us, you know, real quickly, there's a survey out that says there's basically, in most churches, the average participation in choir is 10%. That's sad. 10% of, and so if we got here 20, uh, what, 250 on average, give or take? So that you would think 25 members in the choir just to get to the average. I've been here five years, January 1st. I've never known Friendsville to do anything on average. Amen? We're always above average. So God's speaking to you right now. I want you to come and join us back here as we leave, all right? Let's sing this chorus. Whoa, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is new him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Have a good Sunday. We'll see you back tonight, 6 o'clock. Save a wretch like me.